The next few videos on the channel are going to be about the MVC MVP architectures. These architectures make testing really easy because you're centralizing your logic generally into pure C-sharp classes that are fast to run and easy to test. Before we dive into that, let me know in the comments if you know this channel. Hey there, it's Josh. Welcome back to Let's Game It Out. This guy takes games and exploits the bugs and logical flaws in front of millions of people. I can't think of a better reason to start unit testing games. With that in mind, let's get into it. I'm just going to run around my game scene for a second so you can see what's going on because we'll be coming back to this over the next few videos. I've got some pickups here. I run over them. You can see my coin counter, which is really just a score, is going up every time I pick up an object. The coin collection system is an MVC. The character also has an MVC that's running its physics system, although in this demo I'm just using point and click to move them around. After we have a good understanding of how we can unit test these things, we're going to dive deeper into both of those systems. In Unity's test runner, assemblies are used to group and organize test scripts. I only have one assembly definition in this project at the top level of my scripts folder, and I've referenced all the other assemblies I need, such as the input system and my own library. In newer versions of Unity, the test framework will already be installed, but if you need to find it, of course, it's going to be in the package manager. Some of the sample solutions towards the bottom of the samples section are actually kind of interesting. With the test runner installed, we're going to install one more package so that we can have some mocks and spies. That's the Unity 3D and Substitute open source library. Then we can come back into Unity, install that repository from the Git URL, and then we'll have that inside of our project as well. I've already got mine installed, so I'm just going to come over to the in project view and show you what it looks like. I'm going to create a little folder called test to keep all my tests in and then open the test runner up. You can go to window general test runner for that. And once you have the window open, there's two tabs up here, play mode and edit mode. We're going to start with edit mode. And then there's a button that will create a folder with an assembly for you. Now I'm going to call mine editor.tests. And then my assembly is also going to be called editor.tests. So if we have a quick look at that here, let's bring it up in the inspector. There are already the test runner references here, but we need to add the assemblies that we're going to include as well. So that's the substitute library. And we also need to include our own assembly for our code. So for me, I called that architecture. Notice that editor is the only included platform for this assembly. And don't forget to click apply for these changes to take effect. Now, if I jump back over to the test runner, there's also a button to create a first test script. Now, I'm just going to call my file coin collection editor tests. We'll have different test file for runtime tests. When that's done compiling, if we look up in the test runner now, you can see our new test class here. It has two tests within it. Let's go have a look at them. They're empty and we're going to replace them. So over here, we can see there's just two dummy tests. They're not doing anything, but you can see the different types, regular test and a unity test. The real difference between these two is that a unity test operates like a coroutine. It means you can yield return, wait for seconds, yield return null, and so on, and it will simulate gameplay. Let's clean up all this noise and we'll just focus on the first type of test. Now, the first thing I want to talk about here is assertions. Assertions can be sometimes thought of in tiers. A first level of assertions would be is, has, does, contains, and then a second level would be all, none, some, exactly. You can use logical operators and, or, and not. You can use other things like is unique. Copilot has some good suggestions. I'm going to add is ordered. And then, we're, of course, we're going to make statements out of these and assert whether they're true or not. So let's write a simple test just to get a feel for assertions. If I say that I have a username, user123, we could assert that username does start with the letter U. We could also assert that username does end with the number 3. Now, to run these tests, we have two choices. The first one I'm going to show you is if you're using Rider, if you come down to the very bottom of the window where it says Unit Tests, click that, it'll open up a new window for us here. You can kick off tests by clicking one of the green arrows on the left side, and you'll see the test runner starts to work. But I forgot to save my scene, so it's going to kick me back to Unity. I click Save, and the tests run. You can see up in the test runner that all my tests passed. It doesn't really matter where you start the test from. And just to prove that, I'll run it again right here by clicking Run Selected. There we go. So the test pass again. If we come down to the bottom, you'll see the results and how long it took. Back in Rider, we can also see our success message here. I'm going to close up the unit test window here in Rider. 
And let's continue by looking at a few more tests that are a little bit more involved. Let's just create a new list with some numbers in it, one to five. Now we could assert that the list does contain the number three. We could assert that the list is all positive numbers. We might want to assert that our list has exactly two items that with a value less than three. We could make sure that it's ordered and unique. Let's make one that's a little bit more complex. What if we wanted to know that there were three items in this list that were odd numbers? So we could use exactly matches for this and put in an expression here. Now, this is a little bit hard to read, and you might notice that Copilot actually made a mistake here. This test is checking for even numbers. So this test is going to fail. Why don't we prove that by running it? Now, I've gotten in the habit of reloading my domain whenever I make changes. So I'm going to jump back into Unity, hit Control R, and then run selected. So predictably, our test fails. If we look down in the bottom corner, we can see that it was expecting exactly three items matching the Lambda expression, but it was not provided that. So let's jump back into the IDE. I'm just going to flip this to a not equals. This is still not the easiest thing to read at a glance. Let's make a helper. Public static class number predicates. We can just have one that is is even, one that is is odd. That'll solve our readability issue. Then I can just replace that lambda statement up there with the actual predicate is odd. Now let's come back to Unity, reload, run the tests, and look at that. Everything passes, so we're good. Now, before we start using mocks and spies, let's have a really high level look at the system that collects these coins. There's a main player component that lives on my hero, but it's the controller that's doing all of the logic, and that's a pure C sharp class. Now, the model is actually storing all the data, which is how many coins have we collected? And it's using an observable to do that so that we can subscribe to events in our controller. The view is essentially our UI, and it's going to show the player on the screen how many coins have been collected. The service has the responsibility of loading and saving our data to wherever that needs to go. One of the best things about this kind of architecture is that all of our logic has been centralized to the controller. So most of our tests can happen there and all of the other classes can be mocked and we can have them return any results we want for our tests. By far, the biggest errors I see in software development are logic problems. So in my opinion, if you're gonna write any tests at all, write them for that central hub of logic. Second place would be testing for null reference exceptions. Third place might be off by one errors, which would come from your loops, not counting things properly. Let's take a closer look at this central hub of logic, the coin controller. The coin controller implements a simple interface. There are four methods in it. When the controller collects some coins, that's going to change the model. When we update the view, that's going to, of course, update our UI. Now, there are two other methods here, save and load, do exactly what they sound like. If I expand the coin controller concrete implementation, you'll notice that right under the private constructor, I have two preconditions here. This is a class that checks different things. It has a few extra methods, but the primary purpose is to check for not nulls on constructor arguments. I'm going to be building the controller with a builder, and the builder will allow us to inject mocks into the controller. So we can have a mock view, a mock model, and a mock service. The main logic of this class lies in the collect and the update view methods. These are the ones that we want to make sure are wired up correctly. They're doing what we want them to do. When we collect coins, the model needs to update itself correctly. When we update the view, we want to have confidence that the update coin display method on the view class was called correctly with the right amount of coins to show to the player. I want to quickly look at the model class as well because I've implemented an observable there. This will be relevant as we start to work with properties that are inside of a mock. So don't worry too much about the internals of the controller, model, and view here because we're going to go over the whole thing in detail in the next video. For now, let's go dig into how we can use mocks and spies to mock the different components that make up an MVC or MVP implementation. The nSubstitute library can work with any interface or any class that has virtual methods. When it creates a substitute, the substitute can be used as a mock or as a spy. A spy is a class that can tell us how many times it was called and what arguments it was called with. A mock is a class that can return a value that we want it to. In this case, we're going to create substitutes for our view, model, and service. That way we'll know when they got called, what arguments they got called with, 
and we can make them return any values that we want. We're going to do this in a method that we'll call setup. It can be called anything you want, but it needs the setup attribute. This will make the setup method execute before any test method executes. Let's run some assertions just as a sanity check while we're setting up everything. Next, we're going to set up a mock return value for our coins property. Remember that it's an observable, so what we can do is say model.coins.returns and tell it what it's going to return, and that's going to be a new observable integer with a starting value of zero. Now, it's even more important here to make sure that if you're mocking a property, let's make sure that it was set correctly, especially one that's as complex as this one. There's two ways to write this, actually. I'll write them both here on the screen. The first one's a little bit shorter, but you could use has property as well. With that out of the way, our service has a load method that's going to return the model. I want the mock service to return our mock model. So finally, let's put it all together by creating a controller instance. The controller can use its normal builder, but we're going to supply it with the mock service, build it with the mock view. The service is already set up to deliver the mock model. Let's assert that it's not null, and now we're done. Now the inverse of setup is teardown. I'm just going to put it here to show, but we don't actually need to tear anything down here. Before continuing, let's jump back into Unity and make sure that setup runs before our existing test with no problems. So here we go. I've reloaded the domain. I'm just going to run the tests again. There we go. Again, ran super fast, no problems. Okay, let's test this out. We'll create a new test. And first of all, I want to make sure that we're not throwing any of those argument null exceptions from the preconditions in the private constructor of our controller. So what we can do is run the builder by passing in a null view to the builder. Now that should throw an exception. It can just be a one liner this simple. Another way to write that is to use the assert.throws generic, where you pass in the type of exception you expect to get. Then you run the builder in a Lambda expression. Now, I'll just keep both of these in here and run the whole thing again. So I've reloaded the domain. You can see we've got our new test listed there. Let's run all. So there we go. Took a little bit longer to run this time, but we definitely passed our test. So I think I like the first way of writing this better. So I'm just going to kill the second one. And now we need to test that if we were to pass in a null service, we would also throw an exception. This is almost going to be exactly the same as the previous test, except instead of a null view, we're going to have a null service. So let's make sure we build with the mock view and the only null is going to be the service. That should throw an argument null exception. So now we can write a bit of a logic test to make sure that our view is updating itself correctly. When the controller collects one coin, the update coin display method on the view should receive exactly one time, it should receive a call to that method with the value of one. So that's a very simple test to make sure that everything has been wired up together nicely. Now we should also run a test on our observable. And to do that, I'm gonna show you guys one more thing here, and that is the test case attribute. This will let us parameterize tests. So Copilot has a good idea what I want to do here. What we want to say is when we're starting with this value of coins and we add this many coins, our total amount of coins should be this many. And then we can write a few test cases and try a whole bunch of different scenarios with it. We'll set the coins property of our model to return an observable of the starting value. Then we'll collect the amount that we want to add and then we'll verify that the amount of coins is equal to the amount that we expect. I'll come back in here, reload the domain. You can see our new tests are here. If I expand the test cases, you can see all the details there. I'll run them all. There we go. Very fast again. All the tests passed. That's great. Let's start taking a quick look at play mode tests. To do this, I'm going to create a new folder with an assembly in it. And similar to the other one, I'm going to call this one runtime.tests. So that'll name my assembly runtime.tests as well. Um, I'm going to create a new script in here that we'll manipulate in a moment to add some play mode tests to. But before we do that, I need to jump into the assembly here. If we come and have a look up here in the inspector, first of all, notice under platforms, any platform is checked for play mode tests. 
And I'm also going to add some more references because we're actually going to be creating game objects, putting components on them, things that exist in our game. So I need my own libraries and I'm also going to need the end substitute library. Don't forget to click apply after making changes to an assembly definition. Then let's come over here and change some code. So I'm going to paste in all of the using statements that were the same from the editor. We can include more later if we need to. Rename this class and let's start writing. The simplest play mode test you can have is to verify that your application actually plays. That's a really simple test. Assert that application is playing is true. Another good test would be to make sure that the objects we expect to be in the scene are actually in the scene when it loads. So we can use game object find for that and we could look for different things. And if we don't find it, let's output a message that says this thing didn't show up in this scene. And that'll give us a little bit of information about what actually went wrong with the test. Now let's write a unity test that will run as a coroutine. My actual coins and the coin component act as an implementation of the visitor programming pattern. So my coin component can accept visitors. When we've accepted a visitor, we collect its payload of coins. Now, I want to talk a little bit about arrange, act, and assert, or I like to use given, when, then. This is a paradigm of setting up your test, then executing your test logic, then asserting that you got what you wanted. We're going to do just that in a moment, but I need a test visitor. Sometimes it's useful to make a little concrete implementation. Basically, it's going to be a fake visitor, but it's going to keep track of whether or not it executed its visit logic. It's not going to do anything when it visits other than set this flag to true. And then we can verify that in our test. Now let's jump back up to the test and we can actually say, oh, here, I'll wipe this out. So our given condition will be that given we have a game object that actually has our coin component on it that collects coins, and we have a pickup object that has our test visitor component on it, will yield return null. Now this will make sure that our awake and start methods have run before we get to the next part here. Now when our coin component controller is equal to a substitute controller, we will accept the visitor. Then we're going to wait for one more frame. Then we can assert that the visited property of our test visitor is actually true. Now, some of you might be wondering, why not just use the actual player and an actual coin pickup? The reason is that I only want to test that the accept method works. If I was to put the actual player in and the actual pickup object, then I'm doing more of an end-to-end -end test where everything actually has to be working to verify that the accept method works. But really, I don't need to do that, and that's the beauty of unit tests. I can test this in isolation, make sure that the accept test works correctly, and if you do this with every little bit of your logic, these very small isolated tests, you'll have high confidence that all the public methods, public properties, and whatnot in your game are doing exactly the small job that they're supposed to be doing. I'm just going to make a few changes here. I'm going to substitute the controller before awake and start runs. That'll make sure that we're actually using the mock. I'm also in my verify scene. I'm verify my hero instead because I know that's in my underwater scene. But there's one more problem. In play mode here, it's just going to create a dummy scene unless I tell it to use a specific scene. So if I want to check my underwater scene, I need to do something special. To do that, I'm going to create my own attribute here that will load a specific scene for me. I'm going to implement the iOuter Unity Test Action interface. This gives us two methods. Now, what I want to do in this attribute is keep a string reference to the scene I want to load. I'll be able to set that before every test. And now in the before test method, first, let's do a debug assert to make sure that the string actually ends with dot unity, just a little sanity check there. And then we can use editor scene manager load scene in play mode, and we can tell it which scene to open up for the test. Our after test coroutine can just yield return null. So I definitely want to use this attribute where I'm verifying the objects in this particular scene. So I'm just going to come up to this test and we'll add that attribute in here. And then I'm going to make sure it's going to load my underwater scene for this test. I'll put it on this other test as well. It has no real bearing on the test, so it doesn't really matter. Now back here in Unity, I've reloaded the domain. Let's run all the tests. It's going to go by fast, but you'll see it's going to load a dummy scene for the application is playing test, and the other two tests get the underwater scene. 
And just like that, it's all done. All of our tests have passed. Next week, we're going to take a deep dive into MVC and MVP by looking at this coin collection system, looking at the physics system on that character. We might even write one or two more tests. I'll see you there.